basic exercise that I've used. Um, I'm just talking about something I know nothing about, so I'll just kind of try and use the function of new neurons. Okay, can everybody, everybody can hear me pretty well, I think. Um, so I'm a biologist, and I'm going to tell you a little story about a, biologi a biological problem we're working on. Essentially, I work with um, uh, engineers uh, and uh, material scientists to develop different tools that we can use to study uh, very specifically um, some questions that we wouldn't be able to answer without some of these technologies. So I think that's where I'm going to come in here and talk a little bit about some optogenetics. How many people have heard of op optogenetics? Everybody has heard of that uh, technology before. Has anybody not heard of that? Um, so if you, if during this lecture, since I'm, this is actually a case where I don't really know my audience very well, so if I'm talking about something that's not clear, just, uh, just ask me about it. So mostly, um, I'm going to get to the optogenetics at the, sort of the very end, but I'm going to build up this, this story of this biological question that we've been very interested in. Um, and then tell you about um, some various strategies we've used to try to address this question and then ultimately ending up with this, hopefully, uh, optogenetic strategy that will allow us some very uh, powerful approach. So let me start by um, talking a little bit about, um, let me see, this is not going here. You know how to ad advance the slides? Turn. Oh. Okay, so um, so for most of the history of neuroscience, uh, people thought that there were no regeneration of nerve cells in your brain. Um, so it wasn't really until the 90s when people uh, all agreed that okay, there is continuous generation of new brain cells throughout your life. Before that point, people thought there was none of that. So this is a very huge discovery, um, and people have been studying this now aggressively uh, recently because for obvious reasons. First is, if we can understand how to grow a new neuron in an adult brain and have it integrate into a circuit, that's going to be a very powerful tool for solving all kinds of neurodegenerative diseases, brain trauma, stroke many, many of the diseases. So this is a very important question. The fact of the matter is that there are new cells that are growing and dividing and incorporating to the adult brain. How do they do that? How can we understand these, these cells? We don't also know, this happens, it's interesting, in the mammalian brain, these new cells only continuously divide and incorporate in the adult brain in two brain areas, mainly. Although there's some debate about this, by the way. There's still some debate about how widespread it is. But I can tell you I've looked at a lot of brains and at least uh, there's two areas of the brain where there's a lot of this going on um, in a very dramatic way. I'll, I'll show you evidence for this. And those, uh, one of those areas of the brain is the hippocampus. And how many people have heard of that brain area? Has anybody not heard of that hippocampus? Well, uh, if, I'll talk a little bit about it in a minute. But then also the olfactory bulb, which is interesting. The question that I'm going to talk about is, why? What is the function of these new cells in behavior? And why is it restricted to those only two of those brain areas? There's a lot of the other areas of the brain that don't generate new neurons um, that can um, still encode new information by um, growing new synapses. Everyone knows the terms, I mean, like new connections between other neurons and so on. Um, so it's not necessary that you have new neurons. So why, what's the function of those cells? If there is any, maybe there is no function of it. So let me just show you, um, and this is the uh, brain section um, showing in the green here are the granule neurons of an area of the brain called the dentate gyrus, which is a very important part of your brain in the hippocampus. And the reason why it's so important is because this is the first place where information from all the different sensory modalities, so smell, touch, sight, all those, you know, um, hearing comes in together and um, information comes in, uh, converges in the entorhinal cortex and these cells um, uh, synapse on these granule neurons. They extend their dendrites, their, their sensory part of the cell into this area of the brain called the molecular layer of this region. And they're receiving all this information. This is thought, there's a lot of good evidence. People have been studying this for, you know, 100 years. 
that this uh, is critical for forming uh, memories. So, um, and the idea, actually, the computational idea in the, is that um, this is an area where you, for the first time, are, are mapping um, few into many. So there's lots of, you can see how many cells there are here. And so this allows uh, lots of, of variety of patterns. And this is the idea that this is a, a place where you can form unique representations of multiple stimuli coming together, unique memories that then get stored away in different parts of your brain. But this is where it's happening. Those of you who know some very famous subjects like um, HM, which was, by the way, someone who studied uh, on this campus, a cognitive psychologist named Neil Cohen, studied him many years. But it was a very interesting case of where he had epileptic seizures. They had to, uh, the way they solved this is they took out his hippocampus and, and also other parts of the temporal lobe of his brain. And this subject could no longer form any uh, future memories. He could remember things in the past, but no future. And he's got great stories about this character. But anyway, this is intriguing that this area of the brain is so critical for learning and memory. And it happens to be one of the areas of the brain where there are new neurons generating and continuously. And what I'm showing you here is, is the uh, granule layer, as I mentioned. This is called the granule layer. These are very small neurons, uh, about the size of like 6 to 10 microns diameter. Inside here are stem cells. So there are stem cells, um, not exactly like the embryonic stem cells that you hear about, which are um, entirely multipotent. They can differentiate in any particular cell. These are a little more restricted, but they're still pretty um, undifferentiated. And they can be coerced into, in, in tissue to anything. But in their microenvironment that they're in, they're more likely to, uh, they're 90% they're likely to differentiate into a neuron about 10% into an astrocyte, and maybe, well, maybe not, somewhere between 80 and 90%, somewhere between 5 and 10% of an astrocyte, and the rest, some oligodendrocytes, but uh, mostly neurons. So these cells here, um, what I mean by stem cell, I'm sure most of you know, but this means that these cells are divide what we call asymmetrically. So they produce a daughter cell that then goes on to differentiate into whatever cell type, and then the other one keeps this undifferentiated uh, state where it can continue to divide and produce new cells. And um, these stem cells are re reside here. Um, what I've done in this animal, actually, is 30 days before I, I, I euthanized this animal and sectioned its brain and stained it this way, I injected this animal um, with a compound known as uh, BRDU, or bromodeoxyuridine. And bromodeoxyuridine is basically um, a thymidine analog, so it's a, looks, it's a molecular structure similar to one of the nucleotides in the DNA, except that it has this big bromo group that we can then have an antibody to specifically recognize it. But if I inject it into these animals, it circulates through the blood, and any cell that's dividing, um, you know, when the cell is dividing, the DNA double helix separates and the nucleotides come in. If there's bromodeoxyuridine present in the blood and the surrounding tissue, it'll incorporate into that cell. And then I have a way of, then I've labeled the cells that have been dividing at the time when I injected that compound. And then I can use an antibody to that to see um, if, what those cells are, where they are. And so this, is a, this animal was injected with BRDU 30 days before. And now um, I've labeled those with red. And you can see um, that these cells all here were obviously born 30 days ago and now have differentiated into a neuron because they're both displaying this red in the screen label. And you can prove that. As, as you know. By the way, here are also astrocytes, and you can see some astrocyte generation as well. Um, so this is basically how they prove that, that neurogenesis occurred. By the way, in the 60s, there were these two um, unhappy fellows that, that, um, that discovered this, really, by using uh, uh, a, a, another uh, isotopic uh, labeling approach with thymidine. Uh, but the problem was that they didn't have this co-labeling approach. They couldn't really prove that these were new neurons. They could show that they were new cells in this area. But they looked at the morphology. It was pretty obvious to a neuroscientist that they were new neurons. But no one really believed them until this technique. So anyway, this has been very widely used to prove that this occurs. And let me tell you a little bit about um, the many much research that has been going on in this field for the last you know, decades or so discovering many factors that appear to regulate uh, the rates at which these new cells form and integrate into this area of the brain, which is so critical for learning and memory. And obviously, people want to understand how to grow new neurons in this part of the brain and, and what, the, you know, um, what the function of those cells are. And that's, what I'm, what, what's that, that's the main thing that my lab is interested in right now.
So we know that genetics can regulate this. I'll show you some evidence for that in the slide. One of the big factors, it turns out, which is quite surprising, is physical exercise massively increases the number of new cells in this part of your brain and grows the entire structure so it's larger. And this has been shown um, in, and you can't really easily measure neurogenesis in humans because it requires you to label the cells in this way that I described. But uh, you can do all kinds of brain imaging in humans and you can show that these structures get larger um, with exercise. And presumably um, that's happening from a, in a large part because of these new cells forming. And I'll show you evidence for that. Diet, what you eat, obviously, if you dietary restriction, for example, increases neurogenesis. And we're studying um, one of the big components in my lab now is looking at different dietary supplements, particularly as you age, because these areas of the brain are more sensitive as you age and they are start deteriorating. And so it's even more critical that we try to rejuvenate these regions. And so we're studying different dietary interventions that can do this. Um, drugs of abuse, obviously, antidepressants. Antidepressants tend to increase neurogenesis. Drugs of abuse tend to decrease neurogenesis, although it depends on what dose they're used. We just found a uh, evidence that low dose of amphetamines can increase neurogenesis. Um, stress also depends on the type of stress. Chronic, like psychological disturbing stress that results in, I don't know how many of you know the biology, but uh, like I've heard of cortisol, high levels of cortisol in the blood can occur associated with depression. All these things dramatically decrease neurogenesis. And this has led to actually a hypothesis about depression that's related to neurogenesis, which I don't particularly believe, but there's a big cohort of people believe that, that the effects of uh, that depression is a disease that results from, in part, decreased neurogenesis, and that one of the reasons why antidepressants ameliorates depression is by increasing neurogenesis. And by the way, the reason why, a little on tangent here, is because if those of you know the drugs that are used to treat major depression, like anti, uh, SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, like Prozac, Celexa, Zoloft, the most commonly prescribed medications probably, these, all these drugs um, um, can basically increase uh, um, neurogenesis. And it takes time. The time it takes for these drugs to work in humans is not immediate. It takes like three or four weeks. And that's just about the time you might expect a new neuron to integrate and incorporate. But anyway, there are lots of reasons to doubt that hypothesis. But anyway, seizure, interestingly, here's a clue about, because we're trying to understand where, what, what's going on with these new neurons. Why are they growing, particularly from exercise? Why is that? Exercise is not a particularly cognitively demanding experience, but it's growing all these new cells in the hippocampus. What's going on with that? But also, uh, here's a clue to some of this, is that seizure also, epileptic seizures also can stimulate neurogenesis. So this is strange. So neurogenesis is not only, just because you have more cells that are growing, that's not always a good thing. Um, infection, inflammation can decrease it. Aging dramatically decreases it. So neurogenesis is peaks like, you know, probably in your early teens and then just drops off dramatically. So as you age, in fact, in these old mice that we look at, we can hardly see any of it. It's there, but it's very low. And then people have argued, although I strongly believe, and this is part of the problem with this area, is that because it's such an active area in biology, and because there's such a strong agenda, I think, for believing that these new cells are involved with learning, because it's so obvious because the hippocampus, is that people have made claims that really don't make sense, like learning itself increases neurogenesis, where they have, like, they train an animal to learn a task, and they see, oh, the neurogenesis doubled. And so, to me, that it doesn't make sense for, well, we've tried this and we haven't been able to replicate that kind of work, but also, it's just that if every time the animal learned an event, you like doubled your neurogenesis, then you'd have so many new cells that it would, you know, it just would be impossible to, to imagine. So anyway, environmental enrichment, also like adding toys and novel objects. These are mostly done in rodents kind of things, but you can imagine a human analog to this would be stimulating yourself with, if you've seen those um, ads on TV where they have different cognitive games that they, they're supposed to train your mind. So the idea is, can those things stimulate neurogenesis? And I think in our, we don't obviously have, you can't study it in human, but in, in the animal um, analogy, it does not stimulate neurogenesis. So stimulating them with toys and learning and things like that does not really increase neurogenesis. Seizure, yeah. Running, yeah. Okay. So let me show you some data that we have. This is a very simple kind of an experiment that we can do where we just house animals in a cage without a running wheel or with a running wheel over 30 days. And I'm going to show you data from this. 
um, and now in looking here in 12 different strains. So th this is something that we can use um, in, in um, using my, mouse genetics. Is that there are a whole bunch of varieties of, of, of mice that are available, um, mostly because people used to keep them as pets and because there are lots of different strains, different genetically defined um, animals that have been inbred for so many years that if you look within one strain, all the animals are genetically identical. And they all actually are homozygous if you, at all the loci. So they're not even like, a, you know, identical twin is not like that. They're heterozygous, but they're identical. But um, these are like homozygous everywhere. And so what we've shown you is, is a large genetic variation on the x-axis. Within these strains, they're like all little genetically identical soldiers. So this, if you look at the variation, then that gives you an estimate of kind of the environmental influence or the noise in the data. And then you can see very big differences across these strains. Some with animals that are just sitting in their cages and you see big differences. Look at this strain. You know, it's almost as much as some of the other animals that are running. And then other strains are very low. Exercise, the main thing here also is you can see the profound increase in the neurogenesis that occurs from running. And so we're very interested in understanding why is this happening? What's the uh, function of these cells? One thing people have asked, um, and please, you know, if you have any questions about this stuff, ask questions, is how do you know, because this is a very good question, um, and, and this is like kind of thing you should be thinking about, hopefully, if you're, if you're a critical thinker, is how do you know that I'm, you're not really, you're just, you're saying that you're studying the effects of running, but how do you know you're really not studying the effects of deprivation, given that these animals normally live in, you know, complicated environments, and you're basically putting them in this cage without any environment at all, and then you're telling me that that's running inducing that? Maybe it's just, that's, you, sh you, you just showed me the effects of deprivation, okay? So that's an important point. We have done these studies with environmental enrichment where we enrich their cages, like I was saying, which is the kind of the, hum the analogy to the stimulating, um, um, you know, different types of stimulating environment that you might get from some computer games and things like that. And we don't see increases in neurogenesis from this, so it doesn't seem to be a deprivation effect. Another thing that you can look at, which to me is the best evidence, and don't worry about all these different symbols, I just took this out of a figure. But the main thing you can see is that all I plotted here is how much these animals ran in kilometers per day over the 30 day period when they were running, because these little running wheels, I can keep track of the, of the wheel very easily. And I'm showing you how many new neurons they had. And you can see there's a very strong positive correlation here, which implies that the more an animal runs, the more new cells that they get. So it's not just deprivation effect, it really is from running and it really isn't from st some stimulation. In fact, unfortunately, we can't seem to get even close to these levels of neurogenesis, stimulating the animals with all kinds of new toys and things like that. Yeah, I tried. Have you looked at while you have neurogenesis, are some neurons also dying at the same time? Like maybe you have a lot of 15 cells that were made, but you also have 15 cells that died. Very good there. question, and the answer is, Unfortunately, it's much more difficult to measure cell death than it is to cell growth. There are ways of doing it. There's an assay called a tunnel assay, which basically stains fragmented DNA. The problem is that the cells that are dying uh, go through that stage where they have fragmented DNA for a very short period of time. And the fact of the matter is that although I do believe that there is cell death, it's at a very low level so that you don't really see a lot of dying cells. I think they're there, though, but it's just that there, there are a few of them, and they're only passed through that stage in a short amount of time. There's other ways that you can do it. Um, you can just stain and look at the cells, and actually, if you have a very good eye, you can see a cell that's kind of dying and deteriorating, and that's another way, but it's very hard to do. Um, but I think it's got to be happening, right? There's definitely some turnover happening here, because it's not like this, this can't keep, it does, can, there's a lot of uh, increase. So over like a month period, like 20 or 30 percent of the dentate gyrus can turn over. So there's cells dying. But what we can know from running is, uh, and is that you increase the total number of cells as well. And the structure gets bigger. So although I bet you that with running there's increased cell death, it's overcompensated, I think. But we haven't, we haven't, we need to measure that. I, 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 we're still struggling with a good way of measuring that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is fascinating, but did, have you correlated uh, neurogenesis with some sort of improvement in faculty? Like, do the mice get smarter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's what we've done. I'm going to, we've done a lot of that work. So, 
yeah, you can't, it's not an easy direct correlation with the uh, um, smartness. So looks like in terms of, um, and I'm not going to show all these data, but you see a pretty big variation. Like here's a strain that shows a huge amount of neurogenesis. Um, and unfortunately, you don't necessarily see in a proportionally in increased enhancement in learning from that. And, um, but you do, what's, un what's frustrating though, is you do see enhancement in learning in all the strains from running. It's just not as closely tied to the neurogenesis, which is very frustrating because neurogenesis is clearly a major thing happening in the brain that's relevant to learning, but also it's, n it's n not close to the only thing that's happening in tr from running. Running, it turns out, which is kind of surprising, physical exercise has a profound influence on increasing blood, like very basic physical things like blood flow and you know, um, elasticity in blood vessels in the brain growth of, of new blood vessels, growth of you know, changes in microglia and different cell populations and different biochemicals and neurotransmitters and so on and growth factors and, and, and chemicals that in, enhance uh, synaptic plasticity and connect, make connections. So lots of things are changing from exercise. To us, a big, a pretty massive one of though, are these increasing these cells that grow the whole structure. I just, we're not sure exactly what they do. So this is where um, the whole, it'll end with I think a, what we're getting to is a very powerful, very powerful tool that we're working now with John Rogers and, um, and hopefully Steve event, uh, as well on, on a, as an optogenetic approach that, I'll, that we'll get to. So, so um, this is, yeah, yeah, sorry. That one mouse ran 14 kilometers, that's like pretty far. Yeah, 14 kilometers. We've actually bred mice for high levels of voluntary wheel running. We actually have a, we have, I'm involved with a project that has 70 generations. It's been happening for over 25 years. These mice run up to 30 kilometers a night on their running. Mm -hmm. And we have also, we also have a mouse strain that we're breeding here at Beckman. That we use video cameras to track the animals. So we're not using running, because running is a very, is a specific kind of uh, activity. Although I just saw, I, I was just talking to a reporter about this, because there was a paper that's, I think it's going to be released soon, if not already. Um, um, I, that where they put running wheels in the in the wilderness. <laughs> These, oh, it's out! It's out. They put it in the wilderness, and then they had that uh, animals are just going in there, and starting to run, and the mice are running. They even have a slug that that reported some. <laughs> some the frog ran for a little bit in there. Anyway, so um, running is its thing, you know. But we also are, are 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 breeding mice for high levels of physical activity. We have a we can tr track the center of mass of these animals. And, um, and these mice, in their home cages, just moving around, they can run uh, around like two kilometers. Um, yeah. No, these are just strains. They, these are just, um, they happen to be derived from actually people used to breed them fancy mice, you know, for different uh, coat colors and things like that, that then were taken by these uh, uh, resources like the Jackson Laboratory. Have you heard of that major? genetic uh, repository and have bred and continue to inbreed and characterize. Many of these strains are their whole sequences are known. So they're very powerful tools that you can look to study the effects of genes on behavior. Um, but these are just a handful of, of, of strains that I chose because they're very genetically divergent. They're like, if you think about the, the phylogeny or the family tree of mice, they're like from opposite sides of the highly genetic, more genetically diverse than any two people, you know, that from the most opposite races. So yeah. Oh well, yes, the way that you count them basically is you give them BRDU and the BRDU incorporates and then you section the brain at a month, you can, that's what we typically do, and then we just count these cells uh, in it and it's actually a, a pretty tedious process. <laughs> you have to section the brain um, in 40 micron sections and then um, we have, um, you know, uh, I have large groups of, of undergrads and other people that can help us. Um, <laughs> That uh, take that count the cells. Yeah. There's some automated methods too that we use. Um, so basically, we use the the tedious part is sectioning and putting the cells on the on the on the slide, and then the slides can get imaged fairly automated. And then um, basically, you still need a person though to go and outline. Has to outline the granular layer. I'm, I bet you we could. There's tools now available that we could probably do this more quickly. But anyway, what we do is have people outline these. You know, there's always trade-offs. You know, I have a lot of st students that can benefit from being part of the lab and learn about how to measure neurogenesis and spend time 
you know, circling these things very accurately, and then it'll automatically count down. I mean, the good question. So people have people tried to tease apart the perfusion effects, the blood flow increases from rather than something else, really. And not really. It's hard to do those experiments. I mean, I, I'm going to show you an optogenetic strategy that very precisely tests the role of these new neurons. Although, what time is it? Oh, I, have, I have still have time, right? OK, so the hippocampus. Again, a little bit, let me just tell you a little bit more about it. Just, I'll give you a, cl a clue there when I tell you about seizures. Um, what's going on in the hippocampus with exercise, which is, could be related just to this perfusion, but I think it's something else. Because it's very specific. There's not, if you, I'm going to show you now um, this area of the brain. This is that, that area of the brain that I showed you before that was green, the green cells here. It's called the, the granular layer of the dentate gyrus. It has that crescent shape. Here's the whole hippocampus here. This is a cross section of the mouse brain, right? So this is a side view. This is going to be the nose. There's a cerebellum there. I'm taking a section kind of right through the middle of the brain. That's where it is. Hippocampus is key structure here. I'm just showing you a picture now. There's a crescent shape. You can't see it that well. But these little dots now are not BRDU. These are um, stained for a different protein. This is like kind of the work, this is the kind of, uh, the kind of um, tools that we use in my lab regularly is immunistic chemistry to, to look at the cell physiology. So we section the brain. We can stain for another uh, prote a protein at this time called CFOS. There's a lot of different proteins you can use. But this particular protein is a transcription factor with a very specific temporal profile after a cell is released, is stimulated. So if you stimulate a neuron, OK, what happens is there's increased expression of the CFOS gene, which peaks expression about 15 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. That gets translated um, in a very close proportion to the gene expression into protein, which peaks, protein concentrations peak at about 90 minutes after stimulation, then they trail off. Um, and so it's, it's, um, it's basically, the way I think about it is a, it's a neuronal activity marker. So we're measuring neuronal activation but it's not just neuronal activation. It's neuronal activation to a strong enough degree that it's in, you know, starting up a genomic response. Because these are transcription factors that bind to other proteins that bind to the DNA and cause genes to change and cause synapses or develop growth of the cell in some way. So it's like a way of, of a reporting that that cell was stimulated enough that it was starting, something happened in that cell that was genomic response. A colleague that used to work here at Beckman used to call this, these, uh, this uh, measurement, the genomic action potential. You heard of the action potential, which is an electrical potential through the nerve that happens like in milliseconds. And this is like a genomic action potential. It's happening over a longer time scale, but it's a genomic response. So this is just showing you when the animal's not running and you just take their hippocampus and look at the granular layer and stain it for this neuronal activation marker. This is the level of, of activity you have. And you were asking, how do you measure this? In this case, you, it's very highly quantitative because you can count the number of these nuclei that have a certain level of darkness, basically. And it becomes very highly quantitative, and I'll just show you. This is what an animal looks like when it's actually running. So, and this only happens in the hippocampus. You don't see this in other parts of the brain, so it's not some general perfusion. So maybe that partially addresses your question. Although I was thinking more in terms of, like, is there a model that we could actually block the perfusion somehow with exercise? But, I mean, this partially answers it in that there's, you know, the animals running, their blood pressure's up, but only in this part of the brain do you see this kind of activation. Um, and uh, this is a, obviously the way I show it is very dramatic, but these are not, this is very dramatic. Like, you just can look at the slide and you can see by looking at it whether the animal was running or not if, when it's stained this way. <clears throat> so another way you can look at how important, how closely related this level of activity of this brain area is to the running itself is by doing these correlations again. In this case, I'm just showing you a bunch of different animals here. These data points just represent animals. Um, and on the x-axis, I have the distance that they ran 90 minutes before they were killed. Remember, I said that the CFOS reaches peak levels about 90 minutes. So I'm like capturing kind of whatever the activity was that's most likely going to in influence that measurement that I'm taking. And then this is the number of CFOS cells you can see here. Also. Interesting thing here, and this is a little bit aside for this group, but CFOS and many other of these uh, transcription factors that are used are widely used as also markers for learning and memory because 
their genomic responses in the cells, which is presumably the cellular mechanism for learning. And so what's interesting to us about this is that it is happening in the hippocampus, but notice that we, we took animals that were running for six days, and we did this plot, and that's shown here. And day, we did it after there were 26 days of running, and that's here days 30 days after running, 50 days. How, they're not learning. They shouldn't be learning anything. I mean, they're just running in their place. They're running in a wheel, and they've, like, whatever there was to learn, I would have thought they would have learned it by at least six days. And now they're running for 50 days, and the same thing, they haven't encountered any more space, but there's still this very strong relationship between these markers. And by the way, this also occurs for um, CFOS and, and ZIF-268, and another one, if you know this stuff, is ARC, which is a molecule that's very highly related to, uh, associated in the literature with learning and memory, but it shows the same induction. I don't think it has anything to do with learning and memory. But we're trying to figure out what it is. Well, here's, um, let me just quickly, um, actually, I think I'm going to skip this if I have time. If I have time, I'll go back to this. I want to get to some of our tools now to block. What I can tell you is that I was going to show you some examples of, of learning and memory type to tasks that we can do in the mice to test their ability to learn and remember things. And, um, and as you imagine, there are different mazes you can do, and you can train them to do different tasks. And we, and we know that exercise, for example, can enhance performance on a lot of these tasks. And we know that exercise grows all these new cells. And the question is whether those new cells are critically important and actually contribute to the enhanced performance that we see. And so a strategy that you can take that's often taken in our field is, OK, well, let's see what happens if we prevent the animals from growing new neurons and see how that affects their behavior. And so that's kind of what we did. We did, we did this in the old days. <laughs> well, this is before, I think, optogenetics was even around. Um, we had to figure out a way of how are we going to kill these new cells from forming. Well, we used this uh, technique um, with uh, irradiation. So if you know that irradiation is used for killing tumors, right? And the reason why it's used to kill tumors is because it's a rapidly dividing undifferentiated cell is much more sensitive to radiation because it induces damage to the DNA and then the cell recognizes it kills itself. So <clears throat> we tried using irradiation and, we, and it, it worked. We were able to reduce neurogenesis substantially with irradiation. But irradiation is a little sloppy because it also causes other effects and it you know, causes inflammation and so on. And so that wasn't the best. So the, the next strategy we worked with um, is this transgenic model that we currently have working now. I'll describe this briefly and tell you a little bit about what we've observed, and then it'll provide the rationale for this optogenetic thing that we're doing now. So the transgenic model we're working with now is basically, I want to make sure everyone um, is not up to speed with the molecular biology, but um, how many people know a little bit about how, like, transgenic mice? And not, not a lot, OK. A, little, a couple of people. So, but I'm going to have to say a couple of things about this. So basically, I, we developed these mice. These are transgenic mice. These are mice that carry a genes that we made and built. Um, well, I didn't actually, but um, a colleague of mine um, made this DNA fragment, this construct that we then inserted into the DNA. Um, basically, you can inject it into the, 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 uh, the zygote, and it'll incorporate into multiple different places in the genome this construct that I make. And this is what we refer to as a transgenic mouse. So it's a mouse that carries a gene from a different organism. It's one that I constructed. And this thing that we constructed has a segment of this gene that has a sequence that's referred to as the promoter region of the gene. And that's a very important part of the gene because that's where the different enzymes that are present in your cells bind to the DNA and cause it to transcribe, right? Make a little copy of that sequence of DNA that will then become a protein somewhere. This is critical, right? Because Obviously, your skin cell and your brain cell are not producing the same proteins. Both those cells have exactly the same DNA, but both those cells are expressing very different cell, uh, genes, hopefully. And um, the reason why is because, well, there's a couple of reasons. One is due to epigenetic modification of the chromatin and so on, you know, folding the DNA and only exposing certain genes of interest. But the other is that there are certain enzymes in there, transcription factors, that are specific to certain sequences of the DNA, right? And that means that there are cell type specific enzymes that bind a specific sequence of DNA and cause transcription of genes. Like, for example, in a neural progenitor cell, a very young neuron that I described, those, those uh, stem cells, remember that I mentioned that divide? They express um, a 
protein called nestin that isn't expressed in uh, any other cell type, really. It's expressed in a couple others, but it'll simplify it. And, um, and so if I take, that means that nestin, the gene for nestin, has a sequence, a promoter sequence, that has specific enzymes that will only bind there cause expression of nestin. I take that sequence, okay, and now what I do is I put in this other gene for this thymidine kinase, which is an enzyme. It's not important what it is right now. It comes from a virus, but just don't worry about that. It's just this, a gene that makes this enzyme, and I put it on with this nestin promoter, and I put that into the mouse. Now what's going to happen is any cell in this mouse that expresses nestin is going to express that viral uh, gene that I just put in there, okay? And that's going to be restricted to the neural progenitor cells because it's, that's what's expressed nestin. The thing is that this does nothing, this thymidine kinase. But if I give the animal in its food this chemical called valgenciclovir, then this enzyme will phosphorylate this molecule. It'll uh, alter this molecule in a way which will then incorporate into any, the cell that's dividing. And the cell will recognize this as being incorrect and will undergo apoptosis. This whole big long strategy is a way that I can selectively kill new neurons at my will by just feeding them this valgenciclovir in their diet. By the way, we've done this, and what we found was is when we kill new neurons like this, we see very little influence on any behaviors we can measure. So what does that mean? Does that mean that these new cells are not important? Does that mean that these new cells that are massively growing the dentate gyrus from exercise and that are correlated with enhanced performance are doing nothing? I don't believe that. What I do believe is happening is that the approach that we're taking, this lesion approach of killing these cells, is probably not the best approach because, again, we're dealing with an area of the brain that's highly plastic. I mean, that's like what this brain is do does for a living is it forms new memories. And it has lots of, I'm guessing, redundant ability to do its job even without those new neurons. And so I can kill them, and it's fine. It'll deal with the problems it has to solve in another way. Okay. So that's a, a fundamental problem with our, the logic of the lesion approach here, which is, by the way, a very widely used uh, strategy in neuroscience to study the function. I gave you the example of that with HM. It was an example with a, a classic lesion study where I <coughs> told you what the function of the hippocampus was from lesion. But in this case, I think it's going to fail. And so here's the, uh, and I don't even need to go through this. Everyone knows what, is there anyone here that doesn't know uh, anything about optogenetics? Because then if they don't, then they're going to get lost now. We created this mice now where we have um, this guy from my lab found these mice from the Jackson Laboratory Repository. So that's what I was saying. There's all these different strains. People modified them. And as you know, optogenetics is an exploding field. And so there are lots of my mouse resources that are just available to buy and find and so on. So we found these two mice. Here's a, here's a mouse that has, again, the nestin. You see that? That's going to be good for us because that's going to make this, whatever this gene is, expressed only in our interest cell po population of interest. A Cree-ER complex. Now, here's some of the molecular biology. This is a Cree recombinase. It's an enzyme that basically can splice DNA in a very specific spot. But it has this little thing, estrogen receptor. It's got another protein attached to that, which is going to muck it up. Only if you feed these mice tamoxifen in their diet Okay, the tamoxifen will bind to the estrogen receptor and will al allow the Cree, this enzyme that snips DNA, to become activated. And so if I just have this mouse, nothing happens. It just has this enzyme and it just, there's nothing actually. It'll, it's looking for a very specific site to splice out in the DNA that's missing from the genome. So this mouse does nothing at all, actually, if you have it. But this mouse, here's another mouse that we have. This one has a proton, a light-sensitive proton pump, OK? Everyone know now why we're, does anyone know why I'm interested in this light-sensitive proton pump? Can someone tell me why I might be interested in light-sensitive proton pump? Otherwise, I can go back. So if you, if you hit this uh, cell, this proton pump with, with light, then it'll open up a, a channel, and then you get action potential, so activation of the neuron. Right. In this case, it's a proton pump, so I'm going to inactivate the neuron. If I had a sodium, like a channel rhodopsin, then the light would open the channel, and then sodium or calcium would, would flow in, and that would depolarize a cell and fire a cell. And so absolutely, the optogenetics allows the ability of light to control <coughs> activation of, of cells and also inactivation of cells. In this case, I can't, I'm always stuck on this inactivation, mainly because I don't know enough about these cells to know how to stimulate them in ways that are meaningful. Um, but I can, I, can think about, I can think about just taking them 
offline. So that's why we have this R. Also, there's a little uh, green fluorescent protein. It's enhanced EGFP, is enhanced green fluorescent protein. And here's a little stop sequence. So that's where the Cre recombinase would, would splice this out. And if, if the Cre recombinase were present in this mouse, then it would express uh, whatever cell is, is, has the Cre recombinase would express this uh, proton pump and this green fluorescent protein. So we cross these two mice. And by the way, actually, oh, I didn't put it on there. But I was going to, uh, if you were interested later, I'll show you. We just got the data yesterday on these mice showing, because one of the concerns with tamoxifen is how, it's what's called leaky. How leaky is this? Because without tamoxifen, what if there's a Cre, some of the Cre was active, then I would see constitutive expression of this all over the brain, and that wouldn't be very good. So we were worried about that, but we just showed evidence that's actually really specific. If you look at, we did all the three controls. We did an animal that was uh, crossed like this, that had tamoxifen, an animal crossed like this without tamoxifen in their diet, and we had just this animal that shouldn't show anything. And the two negative controls were like, there's nothing there, and the other one had this beautiful green uh, fluorescence right in the granule layer and uh, showing all the dendrites and processes, which means that that's a big target for our light. And then the optoelectronics part, which is part probably most relevant maybe to this group, is something I know least about. <laughs> But it's something that I'm collaborating with uh, John Rogers, who builds these really awesome um, three, uh, they're basically 100 micron LEDs that he can mount, mount to a very thin, like two to three micron thin membrane. And the thing about this, of course, is it's, that would be a very flimsy thing that you couldn't get into the brain. But the, it, the, uh, the genius of the whole thing is that you take this flimsy three micron membrane with these tiny little cellular sized LEDs at the end and you mount it to a, a rigid piece of plastic needle kind of thing with an with a, um, ability so that you can add some saline solution, some physiological saline that will just loosen that membrane off the applicator when you need to. So anyway, we have this membrane thing, and we have, uh, you may not know th about this stuff, but there's a, what's called a stereotaxic apparatus. You take the mouse, and you basically fix its head, and you can basically insert, the, you find uh, the growth fields of the skull come together, and they form a, 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 a converging point called bregma, which is consistent in a bunch of in all the animals. You can find that spot in this machine. Basically, you can find very precise locations and drop this needle down in a specific location in the brain, and then loosen off the uh, with this, this, the saline solution. You loosen the membrane off and you remove the applicator. And the brilliance of this is that you're left with this very tiny, fairly non-invasive, thin membrane in the brain with these little cellular-sized LEDs with a little wire hanging out at the top. And this just shows our, you know, this is our, <laughs> our excitement. It's our first clunky one that we did with, with uh, Gunshaw and John Rogers' group. And then, you know, what's nice about being here at the Beckman Institute is that we have the uh, two groups can come together. So we have Gunshaw, the, the guy who's building these apparatuses, down there in the surgery, and he can see what our problems are and, and making it better. And now we're down to a very, very small um, piece here that is still can light up. This is after like two months of being in this animal. And in this case, they're just lighting it up with these um, applicators, but the, this is oh, totally wireless. So essentially, what we can do now is we have these mice that hopefully people can see that we can now label specific cohorts of new neurons just by giving them tamoxifen in their diet. So anytime I give them tamoxifen, those cells are going to be labeled for the duration of their life. Notice. There's a couple of subtleties about this model, and that, um, and that is that nestin is only expressed a very short period in the life of the cell, right? Only when it's a neural progenitor cell does it express nestin. But notice that once this stop sequence is spliced from the genome, this is going to be con always continuously expressed. So these cells will continue to express the proton pump and the green fluorescent proton for the rest of their life as they integrate into the circuit. And now we can have this light that's remotely activatable. So we can have the animal learning a task. And those cells are, not, are there now. So if they're important and they're doing something, they should be in, involved in the behavior. And at that moment when I'm testing their ability to remember a particular thing that I taught them, for example, I can um, take those cells offline. And, and I would hypothesize that that's now going to impact their, their performance on these tests. If not, then I think we have a pretty strong evidence that these new cells are not doing what we think they're doing and maybe have completely different function. Um, okay, well, that's all I was going to say. So, uh, yes.
Oh yeah, um, good question. So the, there's two populations of cells, um, the stem cells in the brain of mammals, and one are here in the sub, what's referred to as the subgranular layer, and those are where the stem cells reside, and they divide asymmetrically into these granule cells, which can then move, amazingly, they move um, into the deeper layers as they mature which kind of is remarkable because if you study and look at the st structure of these cells, they have these very complex ar uh, genetic, I mean, um, dendritic arbors that are, you know, very fine processes. So it's kind of amazing that they can move with all that. But they move into these layers um, with their dendrite. They don't move really beyond this structure. These cells don't. The cells in the subventricular zone, which is a different part of the brain, um, aligning your lateral ventricles, those cells, um, migrate quite a long distance to the olfactory bulb. If you have some damage, like a stroke or some trauma, then it's very clear that those cells can migrate into the uh, damaged area and help replenish some of the cells. That's fairly well established. The question of whether there are stem cells in other parts of the brain, um, some people say there are, but the other people say they're, if they are, they're very low levels. In, so, there, so in other words, I think there's some limited capacity for that population to move in some areas, but not others. So I don't think all areas of the brain have a natural regenerative capacity. Yeah, something to do. No, no, not from not running, running, not from exercise. Those don't seem to change as much from any of the treatments that I mentioned. But that, that's been studied and that, those cells, we know, someone asked about cell death. There we absolutely know that that structure, the olfactory bulb, or the uh, particular layer of cells in that, in that structure, um, turns over multiple times in your life. So there's, a, the question is, well, what's going on? What's going on with those cells and the dentate gyrus cells? And no one knows the answer to that. I mean, I've asked, we actually had a very famous speaker on this topic come to the, um, um, recently, and, and uh, one of the co my colleagues asked her, what's, the, what's different about those cells and the olfactory bulb and the dentate gyrus that, that's, that's unique and makes it why they would need new cells? And she came up, I think she said, oh, they're small or something, which doesn't even make sense. But I, I mean, I, so basically we have no idea. But I, my, I, my thought is that it's because these are areas of the brain that are highly excitable. Both these areas of the brain are densely packed granule neurons where there's large numbers of cells firing in synchrony. They're highly activated all the time, which is a metabolic stress in these cells, and so they are on the verge of death all the time. And so I think they do die, and there's high metabolic stress. And so maybe there, that there's some need to, to uh, keep those cells uh, replenished as they die from natural excitotoxicity. But that's pure speculation on my part. I don't think even other experts don't necessarily. <laughs> So can you show me some uh, strong correlation between money and neurogenesis and the is very interesting. Do you think that uh, it may have something to do with blood flow, like to that part of the brain, that, and you can somehow study that and see how... Uh, I, think I think it does. It does. I think, I think it, it, the problem is... It's, not, it's definitely not something general about like raised blood pressure from muscle use. Like when you go for a run, your heart rate increases, you get vasodilation in certain parts of the brain, including brain and, and you know, in general ways. So in that sense, if there's general increase in blood pressure and, and uh, you know, vascular elasticity, um, then, then no, because it's very specific. It's not everywhere in the brain. But it turns out that there is selective, some selective evidence for increased blood flow to the hippocampus. But the question is, what's the chicken and the egg there? I mean, it's, I think it's because the cells are, are firing and they, that costs energy and needs, you know, a uh, flow of blood. So, you know, I don't know if that's, you know, I'm not sure what was caused what. Yeah. Uh, just uh, wondering if you thought about doing, like, gene profiling of these new cells to see if there's a specific gene that's being activated that's causing the neurogenesis. It's a, it's great, a great idea. idea. I, mean, I actually, we haven't, we haven't done that. I mean, it would be a good, we've, we do a lot of other gene profiling kinds of work. Um, I mean, there's going to be a whole host of changes in genes, I think, that will be responsible. And there obviously have been people been doing that in different cell types in this region, but not that I know of in response to running. 
So that would be really cool, actually, to, to take out very, you know, dissect out some of the granule cells in response to a runner and see what, what genes are changing there. I mean, I think the question is, you know, related to that is, you know, what's the microenvironment here that's, that's producing, that's, that's conducive for this division and, and, and growth? Yeah, look for a cascade or something. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the gene signatures could be a big part of it, but there's also a lot of that environment, which is, I think, a key part of it is the blood, I think, flowing in. Maybe even like the physical like stretching and from the blood flowing in there and things like that, but also um, the fact that these cells are firing action potentials in synchrony, and that creates ion flows that, and chemistry changes in the surrounding environment that I think are critical for those stem cells to, to differentiate. By the way, one of the key things that you should, I think, is helpful when you're, when you're thinking about um, this phenomenon here is that, and I forgot to mention this actually, that there's really two ways you can think of how to grow new neurons in the brain, um, at least. Two kind of uh, conceptually different ways that you can get a, a net increase in numbers of new cells, um, disregarding the whole cell death thing. One is that those cells could, could start proliferating like crazy, right? They just start every 10 seconds, they're like generating a new daughter cell. And then most of those cells die, but just because there's so much proliferation, you get a net increase, right? The other way is that, no, there's just the same rate it's just that there's selective survival of the cells that divide it. In fact, in the lab in these mice, 80% of those new cells that are divided are going to die. So, and it turns out that the biggest and most important factor is the survival of those cells. In fact, running doesn't really change the proliferation, although they're used to think that. Now we know it's not the case. We know that. You know how we know it's very easy. Give them the BRDU injections before they even get on the running wheels. You give them the BRDU injections, then you've labeled population cells that weren't even dividing when they run on the wheel. You put it on the wheel, and you see the same increase in neurogenesis that you saw before. So most of this is survival of those cells, and a lot of those cells are dying. I'm just wondering if you're trying to see things in water and water. Yeah, we are. I mean, we're so we have. Yeah, we have a variety of different models. I mean, mostly now we're working with natural aging, which produces uh, dramatic. Uh, we also are looking at a fetal alcohol model, which is not a neurodegenerative. I mean, it's not a. It's an exogenous, drug-induced uh, neurodegeneration. But um, so uh, we're looking at the because there's various different treatments that can recover some function in response to this alcohol-induced deficit. Um, that uh, we want to see what the role of these new cells might be, because that's also neurogenesis is, is hit hard from fetal with alcohol. Heavy alcohol use produces pretty massive, we're talking about large numbers of alcohol drinking over your life, produces pretty severe brain damage and neurodegeneration, including a, a, a hippocampus. <laughs> yeah. So how lasting this is effective is almost Oh, yeah. Yeah, so the cells, so that's a good question. How long lasting is it? The cells that are, were born at the time when you were, they were running are very long lasting. We've looked months, months after. However, if you run for a month and then you stop running, you, you've lost the regenerative capacity. So eventually, and this gets back to the question about the cell death. Obviously, there's cell death because you don't, it shrinks back to the cell size it was before. But you don't lose the cells you generate. It's just that other cells die, right? So it starts, it reverts back to its original structure. The interesting thing about this is, though, the good news is, so you have to keep doing it. You can't just do it for a little while and stop. But the good news is that you can do it at any time. You can start doing it, and it has its effect. Even as you get older, you can double your n numbers of new cells you produce. Granted, it's a lot lower to start with, so doubling it isn't nearly as good as it was when you were 20. Uh, Dr. So, so when you use the thymidine kinase and the uh, antiviral to eliminate neurogenesis, you couldn't make any sort of behavioral difference. Uh, does that include when you couple that with running? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And by the way, and it doesn't affect running at all. I thought it might because I, I thought that those cells, you know, since running is generating them, maybe they function running. No one, everyone, the bio, my biologist friends would think I'm crazy because the hippocampus is dominated by learning. And not, no one would ever say this place. But I mean, since they're growing, grown from running, I thought maybe, but we can prevent it and put neuro, levels of neurogenesis near zero and they still run exactly the same. And they still, and they still the same, same benefits. benefits.
Right. right. We haven't done that work, but there have been work done exactly that. I think actually by um, some of the work was done by Dicerhoth, uh, coincidentally. The guy who helped ident uh, discover the optogenetics has done, I saw a couple papers from him where he showed that it actually was important that you had these ion and electrical activation to cause the stem cell, it stimulates stem cell to proliferate. So there is definitely evidence that that is critical, uh, part of the microenvironment. But I think, the, I think the true complete story is it's going to be quite complex. It'll probably involve electrical activity. I think maybe some physical input there and definitely a whole host of chemicals, including a variety of different growth factors. I don't know if you heard of IGF-1, FGF-2, EGF, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, you know, and different neurochemicals probably. Professor Ruth. Yes.